Sylvia Black. We're continuing with Joseph's plight with unforgiveness part two. Now last week we talked about um, Joseph was sold into slavery. Okay, today we're going to continue with his journey in Potiphar's house. And this is found in Genesis 39, 123. Okay, which reads, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. You can read the whole chapter when you get the book. But, it, but uh, it starts out when Joseph was taken to Egypt by the Israelite, by the Ishmaelite traders. He was purchased by Potiphar, an Egyptian officer. Potiphar was captain of guard for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. The Lord was with Joseph, so he was successful in everything he did. He served in the home of the Egyptian master, and Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything that he did. This pleased Potiphar, so he soon made Joseph his personal attendant. He put him in charge of an entire household and everything he owned from the day Joseph was put in charge of his master's household and property, the Lord began to bless Potiphar's household for Joseph's sake. All his household affairs ran smoothly and his crops and livestock flourished. So Potiphar gave Joseph complete administrative responsibility over everything he owned. With Joseph there, he didn't worry about a thing, except what kind of food he would eat. Joseph was very handsome and well-built young man, and Potiphar's wife soon began to look at him lustfully. Come and sleep with me, she demanded, but Joseph refused. Look, he told her, my master trusts me with everything in his ho entire household. No one here has more authority than I do. He has his back away. He has held back nothing from me except for you, because you are his wife. How could I do such a wicked thing? It would be a great sin against God. So uh, she kept putting pressure on Joseph day after day, but he refused to sleep with her, and he kept out of her, he, so he kept out of her way, he, you know, he stayed out of her way as much as possible. But one day, however, no one else was around uh, when he went in to do his work, and she came and grabbed him by his cloak, demanding, come sleep with me. Joseph tore himself away, but he left his cloak in her hand as he ran from the house. When she saw that she was holding his cloak and he had fled, she called out to her servants. Soon all the men came running. Look, she said, my husband has brought this Hebrew slave here to make fools of us. He came into my room to rape me, but I screamed. When he heard my scream, he ran outside and got away. But he left his cloak behind with me. She kept the cloak with her until her husband came home. Then she told her, then she told him her story. That Hebrew slave he brought into my our house tried to come in and uh, fool around with me. She said, but when I screamed, he ran outside, leaving his cloak with me. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading here and doing of his mighty, powerful, and magnanimous word. Now, we all know that that was a lie, that uh, Potiphar, Potiphar's wife was actually <coughs> excuse me, trying to induce Joseph. Okay, and Joseph was loyal to God, and uh, he decided not to. He refused her every advance. So Joseph was put back in prison, as the rest of the scripture will tell you. Potiphar was furious when he heard his wife's story about how Joseph had treated her. So he took Joseph and threw him into prison where the king's prisoners were held. And there he remained. What you gonna do, right? 
A lot of times Christians are persecuted for righteousness sakes. You know, we do nothing wrong except we refuse their advances. Or refuse to, uh, see a lot of times non-Christians think uh, from a lustful uh, point of view. They think from a physical, fleshly uh, viewpoint. They see something they want and they feel that they should have it either because of their, their position in life. I've had one guy tell me, do you know who I am? And I tell him, I say, you ain't God, that's for sure. <laughs> you know, I didn't really care who he was and I didn't ask him. Because anybody with that kind of an attitude, you know, I don't want him. You know, who, who do you think you, who, who do you think you are? Do you know who I am? <laughs> you know, I'm a child of the king, baby. You know, an heir of salvation. You know who you messing with? <laughs> you know the power that my father has? You know what I'm saying? They want to know who, who, do I know who you are? Like that's supposed to make me want to bow down to you or something? And he bow down to Jesus Christ. And this was Joseph's attitude. He was loyal to God. Because God had given him favor in everything that he did. And Potiphar and everyone else around him had seen that Joseph had favor with God. Okay? And that's the way it can be with you and I. Uh, it can be with you, you know, you and I. Uh, God can grant you favor in everything that you do. And people will see that. And because of you, the people who you are with will become blessed. It's not that you're cursed when you're around them. It's just that you're hanging out with the wrong people. Because you're the one that's blessed. You're working hard. You're making all the money. But you're actually blessing them with your presence by being there. Okay, so and that's the case with Joseph. He was blessing Potiphar. And Potiphar didn't have to make no decision except for what was he going to eat for dinner that night. So, Joseph was put back in prison. Okay, there, but the Lord was with Joseph in prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Didn't matter where he went. You could be in prison and still have favor with God. Okay, he was suffering as a slave to righteousness for doing what was right in the sight of God. Okay, uh, now before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. The warden had no more worries because Joseph took care of everything. The Lord was with him and caused everything he did to succeed. And may the Lord have a blessing to the reading here and doing of his mighty, powerful, and magnanimous word. And that's the way it can be for you and I. The Lord will be with you. And everything that you do will succeed. Everything. Not some things. Not a few things. But everything. And then other people will see that the Lord is with you. That there's something special about that person. But they can't just quite pinpoint it because they're thinking. They're not thinking from a spiritual perspective. They're thinking from a fleshly perspective. And of course they're not going to figure out until they start thinking from a spiritual perspective. Now as you can see, people may be able to take away your freedom, or they may be able to make you do what they want you to do, or command you, you know, to act a certain way, or say certain things, or don't say certain things for a while, but they cannot take away what God has instilled within you. The enemy may be able to take away your money, they may be able to take away your house, your car, but they can't take away what's in your heart or your mind. If you had that car, you can get another car. If you had that house, you can get another house. Because God has found favor with you and everything that you do will succeed. Can I get some hep up in here? Now the enemy cannot take away your dreams or hopes or nor your expectations. Well, the Lord gave it and the Lord take it away. The world didn't give it to you and the world can't take it away. What God has for you is for you and only for you. And people see a lot of times people want the, uh, they want what they see. They see you, you don't look like what you've been through, you know, God, you're succeeding in everything that you're doing, you know, God has held back, you know, this, the negative, he's held back the diseases, he's held back the afflictions, he's held back death, he's held back persecution, torment, not that you've never been through it, but he's holding it back from you now. You've been through it, that's the past, it's over, now God has found favor with you. And he's decided to shine his face upon you. So now you have success in everything that you do. 
and people see that, and they see the what they see is the end result. They see, you know, what you after you didn't come through the rain and the storm, and after you didn't been through all the hell and high water. That's what they see, and they figure if they can just tap into or get a little piece of of you, you know, right now, then they can enjoy the glory that you are exhibiting, you know, that you are revealing, which is really God's glory. God getting the glory. Okay, we're revealing God's glory in our actions, but He's the one that's getting the glory, and the one that's set, which is you and I, is getting blessed. Okay, and so they they want the end result, but I say, hey, if you want anything from me, first of all, you got to be willing to give. You know, you have to be able to give. You know, a lot. You know, you can't be a stingy person, and I'm not talking about money. Uh, but that's part of it. But, the, you know, the stinginess comes from your attitude. It comes from everything that you are, who you are. Are you stingy with your thoughts? Are you stingy with your words? Are you stingy with your actions? You know, what, what is it? You know, I don't, I don't want, I like no stingy person. And I don't like no greedy person either. There's, there's no in between there. But when you, uh, you know what I'm saying? So you know, people have to, if you want what I got, you got to go through all the hell and not water that I've been through first, and I don't think you can do it. You know, and I, you don't know how long I've been going through mess and stuff and junk, and I'm still going through mess and stuff and junk, and so are you. We all are, cause we're Christians. The devil ain't gonna leave you alone until you go to be with the Lord in heaven. That's how I know. You, we all are going through mess and stuff and junk, and you're gonna go through it every day of your life. How intense it will be will be strictly up to how you handle it and how. Your faith is, how your trust is, your hope, and how close you are to God. Okay, but Joseph, God had found favor in everything that Joseph did. So there he was, uh, being recognized for uh, his <coughs> success. And he blessed those who he was working for, who was in their employ. Okay, and that's the way it can be for you and I. So no matter what Joseph, where Joseph was placed, he succeeded in everything that he did. No matter what they tried to do to him, they could not get him to turn his back on God. And they could not stop the success that God had blessed him with. They put him in prison, and he succeeded in prison. The prison wouldn't put him in charge of all the prisoners. So they couldn't stop Joseph's uh, blessing. They couldn't stop it. And they can't stop your blessing either. God doesn't want us to settle for mediocrity. In John 10.10, 10, the Living Translation, it says the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. My purpose is to give you life and that you may have, more, have it more abundantly. Matthew 25.29, the Living Translation says, uh, To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. From those who do nothing, even what they, little they have will be taken away. You remember the story about the guys with the three talents, right? The one that went, the the one that had the one talent, he hid it and buried it, and he told him to take it away from him and give it to the one that has many. He wants us to do uh, things with what he has blessed us with. He don't just want us to sit on it. Okay, that's why it's called currency because it's meant to flow. <laughs> you know, and as you can see, Joseph was responsible with what God had given him. Joseph respected God and was grateful enough, uh, even though he was incarcerated, okay, his body was in prison, but his mind and his soul was not. Okay, you may be stuck on a job that you don't like, or that's not, you know, uh, your, your calling in life or what have you, but it doesn't mean that you still can't succeed at it. I've had jobs that, you know, that uh, I've actually learned some stuff from the job. Some of the jobs were mundane, repetitive. A lot of jobs, they are repetitive. You pretty much do the same thing every day. Uh, but uh, this particular job was, you know, pretty much mundane, but I learned something from it. You know, it actually taught me something. <clears throat> and it wasn't that I hated the job. It was that, you know... It was just, it wasn't, you know, my calling. It wasn't my career. It was a job. That's what it was. Now Deuteronomy 28, 13 says, 
If you listen to the commands of the Lord your God that I am giving you today, and if you carefully obey him, then the Lord will make you the head and not the tail. And you will always be on top and never at the bottom. May the Lord have a blessing to the reading, hearing, doing of his mighty, powerful, and magnanimous word. Now Joseph did listen to the commands of the Lord, and he was careful to obey them. Okay? Now in Genesis 40, uh, Joseph interprets two dreams. Uh, sometimes later, Pharaoh's chief cupbearer and chief baker offended their royal master. Uh, Pharaoh became angry, and these two officials, he put them in prison where Joseph was, in the palace of the captain of the guard. They remained in prison for quite some time, and the captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, who looked after them. While they were in prison, Pharaoh's cupbearer and baker each had a, a dream one night, and each dream had its own meaning. When Joseph saw it the next morning, he noticed that they both looked upset. Why do you look so worried today, he, he uh, asked them. And they replied, we both had dreams last night, but no one can tell us what they mean. Interpreting dreams is God's business, Joseph said. Go ahead and tell me your dreams. So the cupbearer told Joseph his dream first. In my dream, he said, I saw a grapevine in front of me. The vine had three branches and began to uh, bud and blossom, and soon it produced clusters of ripe grapes. I was holding Pharaoh's wine cup in my hand, so I took a, ch a cluster of grapes and squeezed the juice into my cup. Then I placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. This is what the dreams mean, Joseph said. The three branches represent three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift you up and restore you to your position as his chief cup bearer. And please remember me and do me a favor when things go well for you. Mention me to Pharaoh so he might let me out of this, pal of this place. For I was kidnapped from my homeland, the land of my Hebrews, and now I'm here in prison, but I did nothing to deserve it. When the chief cupbearer saw that Joseph had given the first dream such a positive interpretation, he said to Joseph, I had a dream too. In my dream there were three baskets of white pastries stacked on my head. The tap top basket contained all lands of pastries for Pharaoh, but the birds came and ate them from the basket on my head. This is what the dreams mean, Joseph told him. The three baskets also represent three days. Three days from now, Pharaoh will lift you up and impale you, the body on a pole. <laughs> the birds will come and peck away at your flesh. Pharaoh's birthday came three days later, and he prepared a banquet for all his officials and staff, and he summoned his chief cupbearer and chief baker to join the other officials, and then restored the chief cupbearer to his former position, just like Joseph said, so he could again hand Pharaoh his cup. But Pharaoh impaled the chief baker, just as Joseph had predicted, but he interpreted his dream. <laughs> I did my job, right? <laughs> Pharaoh's chief cupbearer, however, forgot all about Joseph, never giving him another thought. Isn't that amazing? That's how some people are. You do them a favor and then they forget about you. Two years went by before Joseph was remembered. God's works, God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Pharaoh had a dream in chapter 41 and the king's chief cupbearer remembers Joseph. Finally, right? Pharaoh sent for Joseph cleaned him up and presented him before the king to interpret his dreams. Joseph gave all credit to God in his ability to interpret dreams, and Pharaoh was impressed. Joseph interpreted Pharaoh's dreams just like he had asked him to, but Pharaoh found Joseph to be an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire Egypt. Okay, isn't that something? See, you're loyal and faithful to God. You never know what kind of blessings will come your way. Now Joseph is made ruler of Egypt. Genesis 41, 37 to 39, New Living Translation, it reads thusly. Joseph suggests, jo Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man, so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? And then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the, of the dream to you, Clearly, no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court and all my people and take orders on, and, and 
of all my people will take orders from you. Only I sitting on my throne will have a rank higher than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck and then had Joseph ride in the chariot reserved for his second in command. And wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted, Kneel down! So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all of Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. Then Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, Zephaniah. Zephaniah Paneah. He also gave him a wife whose name was Asineth. She was the daughter of Potipharah, the priests of On. So Joseph took charge of the entire land. He was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and when Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he respected the entire he inspected the entire land of Egypt. As predicted for 7 years, the land produced bumpy cra bumper crowds. Uh, during those years, Joseph gathered all the crops uh, grown in Egypt. Okay? Um, in Egypt and stored the grain for the surrounding fields in the cities. He piled up huge amounts of grain uh, like sand on the seashore. Finally he stopped keeping records because there was so much more, so much to measure. Uh, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. And now comes the moment of truth. Those dreams Joseph had were having that indicated his brothers and parents would bow down to him were now coming true. Joseph's brothers finally need to go to Egypt. Joseph sent his ten brothers to go down to Egypt. Uh, Jacob, I mean. Jacob sent his ten brothers, or his ten sons, to go down to Egypt. Joseph's ten brothers. <laughs> uh, in chapter 42, but not Benjamin. Because remember, Joseph and Benjamin were Jacob's biological child, born of his wife. And the other boys were born of the maids. Okay, so they were older than Joseph and Benjamin. But though the year, through the years uh, that Jacob thought his son Joseph was dead, he grieved terribly and was in much distress. The Bible indicates that jo Jacob could not be com comforted. Jacob's oldest sons saw how much agony his father was in. They wished they had not done such a thing, but refused to tell their father the truth. The reality, the brothers did not know where he was. Joseph could have been anywhere, or he could have been dead. For real. In Genesis 42, 6-29, New Living Translation, it says, Since Joseph was governor of all of Egypt and in charge of selling grain to all people, it was to him that his brothers came. When they arrived, they bowed down before him with their faces to the ground, just as Joseph had predicted years ago. Joseph recognized his brothers instantly, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where are you from? he demanded. From the land of Canaan, they replied, we have come to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. And he remembered the dream he had many uh, he, he had about them many years before. Okay, He said to them, you are spies. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. No, my lord, they exclaimed, your servants have simply come to buy food. We are all brothers, members of the same family. We are honest men, sir. We are not spies. <laughs> They're honest men. Yes, you are, Joseph insisted. You have come to see how vulnerable our land has become. Sir, they said, there are actually 12 of us. We are servants. We, your servants, are all brothers, sons of a man living in Canaan. Our youngest brother is back there with our father right now, and one of our brothers is no longer with us. But Joseph insisted, as I said, you are spies. And this is how I will test your story. I swear by the life of Pharaoh that you will never leave Egypt until your youngest brother comes here. One of you must go and get your brother. I'll keep the rest of you here in prison and then we'll find out whether you are not, whether or not your story is true. But the life of Pharaoh, if it turns out that you don't have a younger brother, then I'll know you are spies. So Joseph put them all in prison for three days. 
On the third day, Joseph said to them, I am a God-fearing man, and if you do as I say, you will live. If you are really an honest man, choose one of your brothers to remain in prison. The rest of you may go for the grain, for the starving of families. But you must bring your youngest brother back to me. This will prove that you are telling the truth, and you will not die. This, to this they agreed. Uh, speaking among themselves, they said clearly, We are being punished because of what we did to Joseph long ago. We saw his anguish when he pleaded for his life, but we wouldn't listen. And that's why we are in this trouble. Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, Reuben said? But you wouldn't listen, and now we have the answer for his blood. Of course they didn't know what that Joseph understood them, for he had been speaking to them through an interpreter. Now he turned away from them and began to weep. When he, recognized, when he regained his composure, he spoke to them again, and he chose Simeon from among them and had, uh, had him tied up right before their eyes. Joseph then ordered his servants to fill the men's socks with grain, and he also gave secret instructions to return each brother's payment at the top of his sack. He also gave them supplies for their journey home. So the brothers loaded their donkeys with the grain and headed for home. But they, they, they stopped for the night, and one of them opened the sack to get grain from his donkey. He found his money on top of the sack. Look, he exclaimed to his brothers, my money has been returned. It's here in my sack. Then their hearts sank, trembling. They said to each other, what has God done to us? <laughs> the question is, what have you done to yourself? See, you ain't got to do nothing to the enemy, honey. When they mess with you and whatnot, they, and they get it. What does it say? God says, vengeance and recompense is mine, said the Lord. I will repay. Then now their guilt is messing with them. Okay, when the brothers came to their father Jacob in the land of Canaan, they told him everything that had happened to them. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and doing of his mighty, powerful, and magnanimous word. Now the brothers returned to Egypt, but the family continued to ravage <coughs> excuse me, the land of uh, Canaan in chapter 43. They returned to Egypt with Benjamin against Jacob's better judgment. Okay, and I'm going to conclude with this. But the brothers were terrified. Joseph's blood was on their hands. And what they thought, uh, what they thought, they thought that they were being punished for what they did to Joseph. Joseph put money in the sack to pretend the brothers stole it. But when the brothers returned, they offered the money back to Joseph that was in their sacks. Praise God. This story gets more interesting and more interesting. I tell you, there's some interesting stories in the Bible. And I'm going to go ahead on and conclude with that. And I know you're going to join me next week so you want to hear the rest of the story. Because it gets very interesting in terms of what happens next. Okay. Alrighty, so I'm going to... We're talking about Joseph's plight with unforgiveness. Okay. And my name is Dr. Sylvia Black, and I'm going to ask you to holler at the sister next time. Where we're going to continue uh, in Genesis. Okay, where we're going to be talking about what happens to his brothers next. And I'm sure you're going to want to know. You're going to want to be here for that. So I'm going to ask you to holler at the sister. Peace out.